everybody, I'm Grandmaster Robert Hungaski, and I'm here to talk to you about some more end games. And uh, today we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Uh, so last week we discussed the Philidor position of the bishop and rook against uh, rook end game. And at the end of that video, video I made a brief introduction uh, to the end game that we're going to be discussing today, which is rook and h pawn against bishop, which seems like such an overwhelming material advantage that it should be a slam dunk for the side with the extra pawn and exchange. But it actually is not so easy. I remember the first time I got around to thinking about this end game, <coughs> it was almost 10 years ago. I was playing an open tournament in Barcelona, and uh, Sam Shankland was playing in that same tournament, and we were uh, both saying at the same uh, hotel or, or youth hostel that was maybe like 10 blocks away from the tournament hall. So every day we would walk back and forth uh, to and from the tournament and we'd talk a little bit about the games or, or whatever. And I think it was in, in round five that Sam played this game. And <clears throat> I don't know if it was walking back to the hotel or the next day walking to the round, he told me, you know, that's actually a very interesting end game. You should check it out. It's not as easy as it looks. Because he ended up with the bishop and he drew it. And I, was, I remember I was watching that and I'm like, damn, Sam, you got lucky. You were down on a pawn in exchange. He's like, dude, that's like a really famous end game. And I had no idea. And he said, you should check out your Malinsky's video on it. In, uh, I don't know if, you, if any of you have ever heard of your Malinsky's uh, radio show on ICC called Every Russian Schoolboy Knows. It's a great, uh, it's a great show and uh, one of my favorite videos, I mean they're all really good, but one of my favorite is the one where he deals with that end game. So after Sam told me that I went, I went you know, home, I, I checked it out, I studied it, and I was blown away. I'm like, oh this end game is so interesting, but it's so hard to really wrap your head around and especially to to play it well when, when you have it in front of you. So, um, you know, Sam told me about that and uh, I always kept that video. I, I, I entered it into chess base. I put my own analysis there. And then another great resource that I found that also dealt with that end game uh, is Yuri Auerbach's comprehensive chess end games. So I've actually quoted it here in the text of the game. Uh, it's probably one of the greatest endgame resources out there in terms of reference material. There are other books that do a lot more you know, uh, explanation with words, but Averbach is really a great, uh, a great place just to see what the winning method is and then you can put your own words to it. So that's another great place to look. Now I'm going to skip through most of the moves and get to the position that, uh, that interests us for today. This is taken directly from uh, the Shanklin game that I was just talking about. And it's a great place for us to start. Now, I want to make a, a brief correction because last week when I, when I made the introduction for this video, I was taking something very important for granted that's actually very important. And uh, that is that there are two basic requirements that you need to understand as black if you're defending or as white if you're trying to win, I guess, uh, to, to correctly assess where you're at in the end game. So in order for white to be able to win, you need to satisfy two requirements. Number one, the black bishop has to be of the same promoting square as your pawn. In this case, that is not satisfying. Um, but also, your pawn has to be on the fourth rank or farther back, right? Now that is satisfied. So, uh, I'm sorry, if you're defending this, you need to satisfy those two requirements. One is not enough. So, for example, if this bishop were on g7 or if it were on c3 or b2, this would be a win for white. If, uh, so black has the good bishop. 
Now, if White's pawn were to be advanced to the fifth rank, it would also be a draw. So those are the two things that we need to know beforehand, before we even start talking about variations. So in order for White to win, the pawn has to be on the fourth rank, period. So White wins in any case, if the pawn is on the fourth, third, or second rank. First rank, I guess that's not possible. So uh, second, third, or fourth rank, white wins. doesn't matter if you have the good bishop or the bad bishop. But in order for black to draw, you actually do need this, this light square bishop. So OK, now that we got that out of the way, any questions so far? Because we're going we're gonna to build on these two assumptions, and we're going to try to understand the solution, which is not an easy solution by any means. So. Yes. All right, so if you're playing with white, it's very easy. If your pawn is on the fourth rank, third or second, you win. Doesn't matter what bishop your opponent has. Um, if black has the good bishop, which is this one, right, because it runs, it's going to cover these squares while the king covers these squares, then as white, you need to make sure uh, that your pawn is uh, not advanced beyond the fifth rank, right? So, okay. Uh, if, if, white, if black has the bad bishop, your pawn can be on the fifth, sixth rank, doesn't matter, you're going to win anyway. Okay, so I'm seeing in the chat that a lot of people think this endgame is a draw. This endgame is actually winning for white, right? Because if we look at the position, the pawn's on the fourth rank, boom, that's it. End of, end of story. So the question is, how is white actually going to win this? Now, in the game, black played king g7, and after king g5, bishop c2, Rook e7, king g8, and now king h6. So what is, what is the problem that white needs to overcome? Why, isn't white just, why can't white just push his pawn and, and promote? Like what's, what's so difficult about this endgame? Why is it so important for me to keep my pawn on h4? Like if I went h5 and black wastes a tempo and I go h6 and here, what's the problem? Draw. It is a draw, but what's the problem? Why is, why is it a draw? Right, you, you can't make any forward progress. This bishop is preventing the pawn from advancing any further, and there's no way to dislodge the black king from either the h8 or f7, h7 square. So this is a fortress. So what white needs to do is overcome that fortress, right? So first of all, we need to take away these squares from the king. So the first thing that white does is displace the black king. So we want to get the king out of the G and H files and onto the F file, right? So now after bishop D3, rook G7, and king F8. So the first part of our goal here is accomplished. The king is driven from the G and H files. Now, why couldn't the king just go to H8? What could be the problem here? Mate and two. Where? Mate and two. Where's mate and two? Might be on rook over to square? Particular square? D seven? D seven? E seven? Where? D seven if I have to Okay, so rook D seven threatens checkmate and threatens the yeah. bishop. All right? So only move bishop c4. Now you're going to encounter another fortress that black has, that after you give check bishop g8, black is threatening stalemate, yeah. right? So you have to make some kind of retreat with your rook or with your king to allow black some kind of move. Uh, so this doesn't really seem to make much progress. And the other option would be to move the rook to a square where the, that won't allow the bishop to come back and establish this fortress, right? So what, what would that be? F7. F7, and if I go here, right? You give check, 
same thing. So this, that does not dominate the bishop. We need to dominate this bishop. Yes, so in the chat, we have the move rook c7. Now this prevents bishop c4 as well as bishop h7. So the only move is to come back with the king. And now, after a check, king f7, we've also displaced the king from the g and h files, right? So we just need to make sure that this king doesn't go back. So maybe something like this, bishop e4, rook g3, and the king's not going back. So regardless of whether the king goes to h8 or f8, we're going to chase it out of that corner. So that's going to be the first part of the plan. Okay, so let's see what actually happened in the game. Black played king f8. And now white played h5. So what do you guys think of this move? Bingo. You're absolutely right. So we said at the very beginning of this endgame that there were two basic premises that we need to respect if we want to win this with white. Number one, the issue of the bishop. That's, that's never going to change. Once you, you, know, you establish it in the beginning, it's not like the bishop can, can change diagonals. So we, we can forget about that. The other important factor is the placement of this pawn and why it has to be on the fourth rank or farther back. Because like you just said, we need to do a balancing act between two separate ideas. One is going to be to keep this king cut off from the g and h files. And another is going to be to get our king out of the way of our pawn. Because our pawn can promote very easily with the king on f8. If we just go king g5, king f6, then h5, h6, h7, h8, Easy peasy. Game is over. The problem is we can't get our king out of h6 so easily. So that's going to be step two of the end game. Getting our king out of the h file and over to the f file. Now it's kind of, it's kind of like solving a Rubik's cube. You're like, wait, but I get this side right, but then it messes up my other side, right? So how can you get your king out of h6 without messing up uh, the cutoff king that you've accomplished on f8. So can anybody come up with an idea as to how to do that? OK. All right, so where, where do you want to put this rook? OK, g3, very good. And that attacks my bishop, so I will move my bishop back. And what was your follow-up going to be? Now you move your king back to g6, g5. Now you promote the pawn in. And king to Where do you want to put the king? Okay. Now you drop the rook to G no, you have to G seven. Alright, let's say I go here. The problem is that yes, you've got your king over to the sixth rank and you got your pawn to h6, but in the process, you let black sneak into h8, right? So um, here, uh, I don't know, black can just go bishop d3 and you can't really make progress anymore, right? For example, if rook here, once again, bishop here and check, and 
the idea of stalemate again, right? If you just make some random move, that's stalemate. So this is the challenge that we have before us, right? So how to keep this king cut off, but at the same time transfer our king over to the F file? So anybody else want to take a jab at it? So here in the chat, I like, I like how one of the viewers has articulated it. You, you cannot advance this pawn until you have accomplished your idea of getting the king out of the H file and over to the F file. Now, this should give you a hint as to, well, then having the pawn on H4 instead of having the pawn on H5 must mean that there's a certain square that's very important for me to accomplish my goal. Now, what square could that be? Okay, so let's, let's, let's actually go through it in a variation and see what kind of problems arise, right? So the idea is to use the rook as a shield and for the king to sneak behind the rook. That way, at the same time, you're preventing black from playing king g8 or king g7. So what you're saying here is that black can actually stop us from playing our king g4 move with this check, right? But now the king can go to g6. Now I'm threatening king f6, winning on the spot, right? So only move for black would be to try to sneak over to the G or H file. And now white has a winning move. Where does the rook go? Rook D5. And if I go check, right, king H6, and now I don't know, because the king is still, still kind of messed up here. But what I could do is just king f7, and you have to start all over again. So, so unpack that idea. You're onto something. Yes, bingo. So rook c5. So this is going to be an important component of white's winning strategy, which is dominating this bishop. That means preventing this bishop from reaching its key defensive squares of h7 and g8. So all of a sudden, the bishop on d1 finds itself off sides. Right? I'm threatening checkmate. So uh, what are you going to do about that? If you go king f8, well, then I just check you. And after king e7, this is, this is a walk in the park. I'm going to play king g7, h6, h7, whatever. So the only move here is probably bishop g4, right? So now that prevents us from giving our check. So we can push now? I think you could, you could push and uh, yeah, this looks like it's going to be a win. I was actually just looking at, well, what if I just tried to give you a check in a different color square, right? Like you just, you, you just avoided the problem one more move. Uh, so, so I think probably both moves win. But if you play h5, at some point, you're going to have to play like rook here just to get the king out of, out of the way, right? So I think there's more than one way of winning here. And you can start to tell when the position is winning when this bishop is, is having a hard time sort of getting back home. So that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. This was great. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's going to be so much harder, so much harder than this. Uh, so after, oops, after rook g5, the key is to control this square before the, bishop, the, the king gets to h5. That way, when we give a check, it can't go to g6. So the key move here is king to f7. Now, if you go king h5, I go bishop e2 check. And you have to go back, and then I go back. And you can't make any progress, right? So this is the key position of the endgame. And I think now, 
it's not going to be a spoiler alert as to why it's so important to have your pawn in the fourth rank. You need this square to, to maneuver your king out of this, this jam. So after uh, king f7, what do we do? How do we make progress here? And here we're going to use some themes that we talked about last week when we discussed the Philidor endgame. Well, rook g7 is an interesting move because the ideal square for the king is f7, right? So this would be a, a tactical theme we would know as the in-between move. You, you throw in a check to dislocate your opponent's defenses and then continue with your own idea, right? So for example, if king f6, what would be your, your follow-up? Oh, it's so tempting. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you, you know, I always say to, to students, oh, don't worry if you never get this in one of your games. It's not the point. And then I actually got this in one of my games, and I was like, oh, God, what a nightmare. It's actually better not to get it in one of your games than to, like, study it and hope to get it. Okay, so let's say you, you do go h5, uh, and I, I just waste a move with my bishop. The problem is, if you do something like this, you're just going to drive me back to where I want to go. No, there's a, there's a much more serious problem for black here. OK, so that attacks the bishop. So if I move the bishop. Excellent. And after here, then this is over, right? You're going to push this pawn very easily. Okay. Now, what happens if I, if I block with the bishop? But you've got more than enough time. You can just waste them. And now after the king moves, then you can, you can sack. And now you, you definitely make it there in time. So definitely on to the right idea. Now, what if I say, well, you're trying to check me and yeah. kick my king out. What if I go here? Aha. Uh -huh. So now if this, same deal. Well, not necessarily, right? Here, you still don't want to take because black gets there in time. But you could just drop your rook back. Just going to go h5, king g7 anyway. So, and if, and if here, here, it is the same thing. So the king can't go to f6 because then you, ex you open yourself up to uh, all these moves that hit your bishop and threaten to check you and displace your king even more. So the king always has to drop back, right? Now, here, we can't really play rook g5 because that would just repeat the position. But this king is going to be one move away from its perfect square. So we need to find a way of getting our setup in place where we can maybe create some threats and put our rook on g5 
and white won't have and black won't have his dream defensive setup king on f7 and bishop on either you know d3 or c2 so what can we do here Okay, so rook g3. Now let's say black plays bishop b1, just moving the bishop as far away as possible. But don't I just get to play king f7? Ah, yes, I made him give up too soon. Yeah. It was just, I said it with such confidence, but he was doing a great job. The bishop here is totally misplaced. Yeah. Like the king was misplaced on f8. So the point is to get both black pieces misplaced simultaneously so that when it's black's move, he can only fix one of them and you won't have enough time. And this, that's exactly what's happening here. Because now after rook g5, you can get your bishop back into the game, but not your king, and we get to this position that we've already seen. Or you can get your king back into the game, but not your bishop. So now I get to play king g4 because you don't have the check on d1 or e2. Okay, so now we see how white is thinking about this, how white is thinking about overcoming this resistance. Now, here comes the hard part. It cannot go to b1. The bishop always has to stay either on the d3 or c2 squares because it needs to be able to check the king when it gets to h5, right? So the only move for black here is bishop c2. So what do we do now? Because if we go rook g5, then it doesn't seem like we're making any progress. Let me just see how we're doing here. Uh, let me just make this the main line. So let's, let me just see where we're at. Uh, so anyway, right, we were talking about uh, rook g3 and now bishop c2. So how do we make progress here? If I go rook g1, then I think you just go king f7. Or is there a problem here? So the key in, of white's victory lies in forcing a position where this bishop cannot stay on either c2 or d3. Right? This is a very dangerous situation to be in in an endgame when you arrive at your utopian perfect position. That's when you're at your most vulnerable. Because if it's your move again, you're, you're in big trouble. You have, to make, you have to make a move that will undo your perfect position. So all we need to do is sort of lob the ball over back in black's court. Yes, rook g3. So after rook g3, you're saying to black, your king looks great, your bishop looks great, you have to move one, right? So if you go king f8, I think that now, is this? No, no. 
this isn't right. Wait, hold on. Am I at the right file? Right, so we're here. Uh, so I think rook g1 is one move. And after king f7, OK, I see. The move we waste is, is rook g1. I think it might work with rook g3. I think it's the same idea. But the point is that now, right, if bishop here, king h5, and now if you go king f7, this is the position that I want to get to. This is a position when you're in, in Zugzwang. Because if you go king f8, can I go rook g5? Yes? If you go king f7, I go king g4, and I get out. And if you go check, I go king g6. So that's a zugzwang for black. So after rook g3, you can't move your king. Uh, well, can you go king f6 here, actually? Because if check, you still have king g7. Hmm. What's going on here? King f6. Because if I go here, you go back. This king on f6 looks awfully strange. Oh, I see. There's a nice win for white here. This king is never supposed to be on f6, for good reason. This is, this is the king's comfort zone. So what happens when the king steps out of the comfort zone? How can we make sure it stays there? Yes. So rook c3 hits the bishop if the bishop I don't know, tries to stay on this diagonal, then we go rook c7. And now the king is cut off. So all we need to do now is play king h6, and, uh, and this king is just, uh, I think it's just done. It's only a matter of time when, after we get the king to h6 that we threaten the bishop and we go rook f4 like we saw before, right? So for example, bishop d3, king h6, bishop e4, then rook c4, and We've seen this before, this pattern, right? So the king can't go to f6 either. Where? So after king f6, rook c3, which check? Wait, but, but wait, I, I, go, I go to h6. OK, but remember, this is also a factor, right? The dominated bishop. So you might get your king to where you want it, but not your bishop. So now I can go uh, check, for example. You, you would probably go here, and now you have no checks with your bishop because your bishop is so poorly placed. And again, we have this position where the bishop goes uh, to g4, and then you, you can just do something like here and here, right? Oh, I told you. I told you this would, this would be a tough one. I've only been studying it for about 10 years. And it's, I'm still looking at it. And I'm like, what? wait, what if he does this? Um, end games, you got to tackle them through layers. Right? Like the first time you take a jab at an end game, just try to get a general outline of what's going on. You know, how, how do you win or, or draw? Like what's your goal here? Like if you're playing with white, you obviously want to try to win this. So what are the situations in which white wins, right? So if you can identify that no matter what you do, you should not push that pawn beyond the fourth rank. Like your idea is to create this bridge so that your king can get out. If, if you go at this endgame with that simple idea, even if you mess it up later and you draw it, at least you'll be building on a solid foundation. And then the more times you, you look at it, 
the, the easier it's gonna, it's gonna become. This is by far the hardest endgame I've ever studied. So you know, if you're feeling like, hey, this is insane, welcome to insane in the endgame. This is, uh, so, okay. So we played rook g3, and it seems like uh, black is in total zerg swing. And this is, uh, I don't know if, if any of you were in my class last week on the Philidor endgame, where I told you, you need to take a leap of faith when, when I tell you that you need to get your opponent's rook to c3, right? right? Well, you need to take a leap of faith when I tell you that this is the absolute key position that, that needs to be uh, uh, sort of branded in your brain, knowing that this is how you win the end game. This is the zugzwang position. After this, uh, black just breaks, right? So black's only move here is, again, check, king g5, and then the rook's coming to c3 and c7. All right, but this is easy, so let's make this a little bit harder, right? So uh, after rook g1, black doesn't have to play bishop c2, right? Because after bishop c2, king h5, king f7, we get our zugzwang position. So let's try to find some other moves for black besides bishop c2, because black never wants to put this bishop on c2, because then that's going to run into rook g3. So what if black plays king f7 instead? Here, if you go rook g5, you kind of force the bishop to c2, but black is able to maintain the, the perfect defense because you don't have any way to make further progress here, right? If king h5, then check. So rook g5 is not the move that we want. Rook g2, well, I think this, I can, I can just hit your rook probably. So we were saying king f7. So what would be the other natural part of white's plan? Like what, what are the moves that are necessary to win besides rook g5? Yeah, so king h5 has to be a candidate move. Because now if bishop c2, winning zugzwang position. Right? So, so like the first time that I tackled this endgame, I would simply try to, to build the bridge and it wouldn't work. The second time, I would know that this is the winning position that I need to get to and I just wouldn't be able to get to it. I would mess something up along the way. So that's probably where, where most people run into the most trouble because it's actually the hardest part of this endgame is getting to this position if, if black doesn't cooperate. In practice, you always get to this position because it's incredibly hard for, to defend this as black too. Uh, black has to know all this stuff. It's not just you. Uh, so after king h5, what are the other options? What about, what about king f8? This one's easy. Now rook g5. You can't stop both king uh, g4 and king g6 at the same time, so you lose. What about king f6? That's right. <laughs> never, never. You should never go to f6. It's a great rule. See, because if you have certain memory markers or, or just uh, milestones in the position that will raise a red flag immediately. You'll, you'll know what to look for. So this, what's that? Rook where? No, I didn't say anything. What did you say? I did not say anything.
I remember there was this really, uh, it, was, it was a master, he's kind of well liked by the people that knew him really well. If you didn't know him, you would absolutely hate this person because he did not like people chiming in during his lessons. Uh, for me, it's the opposite. I think it's kind of boring if you're the only one talking. But if you would be showing something and somebody would yell out, Rook G1, you'd be like, who said that? Who said that? He would grab a pencil and a piece of paper and he said, what's your name? You write down your name. So I just want to remember this name because that was such a brilliant move. I've never seen such a good, and it would like lose immediately, right? And uh, he would just make you feel so stupid. Like you would never, you would never think of, of saying anything ever again. Uh, and I remember I was kind of a victim of that a couple of times. I was like, okay, no, thank you. So don't, don't be afraid. If you made a, a bad move, I will, not, I will not take down your name. Uh, I, know, I know how that feels. Okay, but actually that's, that's not so easy to do, uh, right? Because we can't go rook d1. Oh, that was your move. That was your move. Your, your gasp gave it away because that was the move I wanted to play. Um, so the other way would be to maybe attack it this way. Uh, another move I would want to play is maybe here, right? But then just king f7 and we don't really make much progress. So let's, yes, attack the bishop. Right? And where does that bishop go? If you give a check, I go here, and I'm very close to, to kicking your king out to the e file, and then it's just over. And if you go back with the king, now what do we do? Right? Which, which one of black's pieces looks a little off? Yes, right? Just like we have the dream squares for the bishop, we have the nightmare squares for the bishop, which are d1 and e2. It's on the wrong diagonal. So how do we usually dominate a bishop that's on this unfortunate diagonal? Rook where? Rook e3 and... Uh... No, no, that's always good. Uh, so the, say the bishop moves. Yes, right? So you could do it here. Maybe you could probably do it right away, right? The important thing is wherever your rook goes, that it makes sure that it, these squares are under control, right? So c3 does a good job at both of them. It's a c3 square. It is a c3 square. Isn't that something? Yeah. Like every end game. Uh, every end game I talk about, the c3 square is incredibly important. Um, so now you have the bishop problem again, right? Because check here and the king here, yeah. and uh, you're done. Well, maybe. No, you're done. No matter where the bishop goes. Like, if you go here, instead of going to b7, I'll go to d7. Uh, maybe one. Yeah, b7. Oh. <laughs> oh, you're just testing you. Oh. <laughs> maybe one. Good job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please, somebody take, take down my name. I'm ready. I'm ready for the big leagues. Uh, so, Let's see, let's go back. So the king on f6 is definitely not looking good for us. Now, our idea, let's say, um, so we were, just, we were just looking at king f6, we looked at king f8. So let's look at bishop c2. It's a trick question. Yes, yes, it was a trick question. I just wanted to see if you guys were looking for it. So rook g3, zugzwang. 
So it looks like the only move, uh, well, not, not the only move. Maybe I can do this move, too. Right? What would be wrong with, with rook g3? Why is it this zugzwang? Bishop where? C2. Bishop c2. You haven't really undone black's dream position. Black actually was able to establish it just in time. So why this position that we said was zugzwang, why can't black just go bishop e4? Right? Unlike with the bishop on b1, if you go rook g5, I still have a check. What's the problem? Rook e3, and uh, let's say I give it check. I'm getting ready to. Why not? Ah, the, the bishop's too close, right? And if you go here, then h5, and you lose. So the end game is all about domination of the bishop, right? This bishop has, it's like, like sort of Goldilocks, you know? It just, it needs that, that soup to be just right. And the only square that's just right for the bishop is c2. So just like, when we see a king on f6, it should raise a red flag for us. When we see this bishop on any square rather than, than c2, immediately we should think, OK, this is my window of opportunity. So for example, b1, d1, e2, e4, these are all problem squares. Now, the only square that's decent for the bishop besides c2 is d3, and that's why rook g3 is such an important move. It takes away the only good remaining square for the bishop. So OK, let's see. Uh, so we're looking at king h5. Uh, we know that bishop e4 doesn't work simply because of king g5. We don't have to put the rook on g3. We're just going to get the, rook, the king out anyway. Um, we know bishop c2 leads to zugzwang after rook g3. Um, we know bishop e2. Well, we don't know bishop e2. This is actually the, the only move that we have left, the only idea that we have left for black. So what do we do? only move, right? I mean, we have to play this move. Because if we go here, then the position just gets repeated. So king g5, and of course now black goes king g7. The difference on e2 is that you, know, you can't get hit with king f4. The bishop is on the wrong diagonal. Yes. OK. Rook g3. Right. Because what would have been wrong if rook c1? Right, the problem is the bishop just goes back to the diagonal at once, right? We're not dominating the bishop at all. If king h8, maybe you're giving me a chance to keep your bishop out of the game. Or, or maybe actually here I could go king h6 first. Or, yeah. yeah. I wanted to go here so I could go king g6, which looks like a much better move. 
But uh, in any case, I think, yeah, rook g3 looks, uh, looks like a good move. Uh, is that enough, though? Right? Yeah, rook g3, what if I go here and try to make my way back this way? It's so important for the bishop to get to control these two squares. So just because it's on this diagonal doesn't quite mean that it's going to get either to either one. So, anybody thinking about anything? What's the first move that comes to mind? Like yes. And what's the problem? Where does the bishop go? Okay, let's try this. And uh, I guess we go here. Only move. And now, I suppose, is it king g6? I'm trying to remember. Uh, uh, maybe it's king, because if I go here, white has a threat in these positions, and it doesn't have anything to do with rook c8. It has everything to do with getting the pawn to h7. So the only time that you will move this pawn is after you've guaranteed that it can get to h7. Because then your king goes to h6, and it's not stalemate anymore, because when black plays bishop g8, you just take it, right? So for example, if black goes bishop b3, now it's over, right? Just h5, I think, isn't it? Bishop here, threatening check, right? If I go here, you have check still. So that's, that's no good. This is a... This is a draw now, right here or wherever. So king h6, if I go h5, bishop h7. h6, bishop g8, king, oh, does that work? I don't think so. All right, h5 here, here. If you do this, then I win, because h7 comes. But if you just play your bishop anywhere else, this is a draw. I can't get to g6, and it, that means I can't get to play h7. So draw. So let's see here. Because I only analyzed the move bishop f7 in that position, but it should be very similar to bishop g8. So let's see, after bishop f7 here, king g8, and now h5, bishop moves, king g6 threatening mate, and threatening h6, h7 as well. So how can we do that if the bishop goes to g8 right away? Can we do that? Oh, so wait, we were looking at check, king h8, right? And now after king g6, bishop b3, what if I throw in this move, here and now here? I'm threatening mate, so you have to go back. And now if I go here, if you go bishop g8, then I go h7, h6, h6, h7, actually. So you have to, you have to threaten some kind of check. You have to get on this diagonal. How can you do that? All right, and now plenty more where that came from. So I win that tempo, and I prevent you from giving the check. I'm then threatening mate. So you go back, and I win another tempo. And that's how I, I keep making progress that way.
All right. I'm learning stuff too. I, didn't, I, I don't know. I'm figuring this out as we go along. Uh, okay. So that's it. That's the end game. See, it wasn't so hard. Uh, piece of cake. So anyway, let me show you, because <laughs> you go through all of this, and then you see it happen in the game, and people just go like H4, H5 immediately. You're like, ah, come on. Uh, it's very frustrating. So let's see in the game how white messed this up. Right? So far, white's doing a good job. King f8, and now he goes h5. And here, the wind just goes out the window. Because now you don't, you, don't, you don't have anything to go on, right? Because how are you going to get this king out? So the rook drops back, and now the king makes it to the corner, and it cannot be displaced. So this is an easy draw, right? Stalemate. OK, let me show you another example. Let's see. Um, Actually, this one happened to me. Let's go to the key moment. But this was actually pretty tricky. Uh, here, no. Right, so I had a, a tricky endgame where I'm up in exchange. My, this should be a draw, I think. My opponent makes a couple of mistakes that allows me to sweep up some pawns. And what made this endgame kind of hard was that, well, you know, I still have to take down two more pawns before I can even get to, to the position we've been talking about. But I actually managed to get, to get there, right? Here, and now one down and one to go. So rook d4 and now d6. And uh, this is where, where it gets tricky. How would you play as black? seems like we got to get rid of this d-pawn before we can even start working on this endgame. But in order to get rid of that d-pawn, I think we got to play h4. So I'm kind of torn. I'm like, I want the pawn, but I don't want to put my pawn on h4 because I know I'm not going to win that endgame later. right? So I remember, and you're also, when you get here, you're usually very low on time already. So it's this, this cocktail of bad things that make it almost impossible to play this endgame. You either win this endgame without thinking, or you, you just draw it, right? Uh, so it has to be almost a reflex by the time you get around to it. So I played h4, which turns out to be a mistake. Um, the key move here was rook d3, and to try to put white in a zugzwan where he, he will have to go d7. Well, actually, since the pawn's on d6, it takes away some important squares for the, for the bishop. So for example, let, how would you play as white? OK, bishop h2. And if I go check, you have to go to g1, because if you go to g3, I take it. And then we know how to win that. So now I go here, or here maybe. Or, no, 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 this, I think this move is better. You're in this weird kind of almost zugzwang position, right? Because if you go bishop e5 after rook, oops, after rook e5, you lost your pawn. Because if you go bishop h2, which is the only move that keeps the bishop on the diagonal, right? Uh, or no, or do I go here? 
I think maybe I won't even go for the pawn. I'll just checkmate you. Right now you have no moves. Well, you have king h1, but I can go here, and after this I take it. Right. So this is the idea. This is how you how you win the pawn without advancing your own h pawn. You you work on you know mating nets and zugzwangs so that white has to either let you take on d6 or has to play a desperado d7 move, something like that. So. Well, so here we, we were looking at bishop h2, but you're right. The problem seems to be this king, right? So what if I go king g2 instead? Yeah, and now bishop e5. Right? And now he has, and now he has to go d7, because he has no, no good moves, right? Again, if here, check, here, here, I'm forcing you to go bishop g1, right? Because now it's never stalemate. I can always waste a move. And you have to play d7, and I'll take it. So for example, well, here, if you move the bishop anywhere else, it's just mate. So you have to go bishop g1, and I take it, right? So this is where, where I messed it up. Uh, and instead, right back here, I played h4. And now it just goes out the window. Because what all white needs to do is play d7, give the pawn away, put the king on h1, and that's it. So bishop h2 here. And now I go for the, for the mating net idea, but with the pawn on h4, it's just much weaker. So he goes d7, takes, and he plays king h2, and now it's a draw. Because there's no way for me to first force the king over here and then sort of get my king out through g5. But life is fair. And he made the last mistake of the game, right? Uh, fair to me, not to my opponent. That's what I, I tried. So he goes, uh, so far, so good, right? I, I drive the king out of the G and H files. But now I got the problem, how am I going to get this king out of here? And red flag. Red flag, right? Never, ever go there. You have to always go back. Stay close to g1 and g2. So after he played king f3, what do we do? And after the bishop moves, yeah, right? We drive the king away, and then it's easy to promote this pawn. And if bishop e5, desperately trying to gain a tempo here to get back. In, yeah, and here. Yes, because we already, we already messed it up, so the pawn is where it's supposed to be. So we can pretend like we meant to do that and go king g2, and it's a win. So I got lucky, actually. It wasn't fair at all. Uh, and, I, and I got to win the game. It's the only time I've ever had this. But it was actually very useful to know the method, because I knew where I messed up, but I also knew how I could try my best chance to win it. Right. So, so how to drive the king out of the g and h files. And eventually, that prompted his mistake. And that's how, how you're, it's never going to be clean. It's always going to be kind of dirty when you play it in, in an over-the-board game. So just having some vague ideas of, of how you can poke around at your opponent's position is usually going to be enough to win the game. Now, if you manage to play it perfectly, then you're going to feel it's elated. It's one of the greatest feelings ever when you play a nice, smooth endgame. So anyway, it's a really tough endgame to learn. It's pretty tough to explain it, too. Uh, but anyway, I hope you, you guys are taking something away from this. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, that's it. So thanks for coming. <laughs>